Good evening, Sheridan Hills. It's Wednesday night, and uh, for these summer weeks, when we come into Wednesday night, we're going to take a few minutes and look at this theme over and over again for the next few Wednesday nights. The attributes, attributes of God in everyday life. The attributes of God in everyday life. Um, I just have a question for you. Is there anyone that you truly, truly enjoy and you love but you don't really know them. Um, I doubt that's true. If you, if you love someone, it's in part because you know them. And so that is our goal over these next few Wednesday nights. We're going to take just a few moments of Bible study, a few moments of a deep thought concerning the attributes of God, his characteristics, who he is, and how it applies to our daily life. And so our hope is that by knowing God better, that you will love him more. And um, I believe that these Wednesday nights can help you with that. Let's go to the Lord and pray and ask him to bless our moments of here looking at uh, one of the key attributes of God this evening. Father, I do thank you that we can come on this middle of the week and have a thought about you. Um, I pray that there would be a deep thought about you in our minds and in our hearts. And Father, I pray that as we consider who you are, Lord, that we would come to see your beauty, that we would come to see who you are better, and that we would come to love you more. And Lord, as we love you, um, that we would come to obey you more. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless this feeding of our mind through the beauty of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Philippians, we've been studying many different things, but there's a verse that we looked at a few months ago, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, and I want you to see it. We've already studied it in our main study on Sunday mornings, but this so applies to our study of the attributes of God. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, we see the Apostle Paul say this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count everything as loss in comparison to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, to know him. I remember that when I was a young man, I had on my resume as I was interviewing with churches uh, to be a youth pastor or a pastor of missions or something like that, um, that my chief goal, what was the goal of my life, was to know him and to make him known. And um, I just, I've always thought about the beauty of knowing God and um, the fact that he calls us to come be a student of him, to come and learn who he is, to know who he is. And so that's what this study is about. Um, When we look at attributes, we talk about characteristics. It's a little bit like if you're getting to know someone and you're recognizing um, parts about their personality, you're recognizing perhaps parts about who they are as a person, even in their physical um, selves, that you, you would recognize the things that make them them. Um, well, tonight we want to look at some of the things that make us come to know who God is by his characteristics. Now, when you're talking about attributes, you're talking about two classes of attributes um, or characteristics of God, those that are communicable or those that can be given um, or be shared, and those that are incommunicable, or those that cannot be shared. And it's important as um, God's people, that as we study him, and as we come to know who he is, and that's what the whole Bible is about, uh, it is a reference manual on who God is and the way he thinks and all all about him. As we study who he is, it's good for us to know what are the things that are that are completely communicable, that are the things of God that he wants us to take on versus the things that are incommunicable, which are the things that we will never be able to take on. Well, let's think about a couple of the incommunicable, incommunicable characteristics or attributes of God. First of all, that God is eternal. Well, we are, we are not eternal. Um, he is. He has made us. Um, before he existed, um, he created, excuse me, before we existed, he uh, existed and created us. So he is eternal. We are not. He is unchangeable. We are not. We have to change. Um, he transforms us. But God is immutable or unchangeable. How about this one? God is omnipresent. 
Now, um, we are simply not omnipresent. Um, we will never be omnipresent. But God has always been omnipresent. That means everywhere, all at the same time. Those are the incommunicable attributes of God. But things the, that are the characteristics of God that he invites us to be like him are very different than that. For instance, let's think about these. The communicable characteristics of God are that God is love. And he calls us to be people who are people of love, like he calls us to love. God is merciful. He calls us to be merciful. God, is, God has knowledge, and he calls us to come. He's given us a mind and an intellect so we can grow in knowledge, that we can come to know him, and we can come to know things about him. How about this one, that God is just. He calls us to be people of justice. So these are the characteristics of God that are communicable. They can be communicated to us so that we can also take them on. Now, the one key communicable characteristic that we often would have in our minds is not necessarily one that we can share with him in ourselves um, initially in this life, is the the tremendous attribute of God's holiness. And that's the one I want us to take just a couple of minutes and really think about. The fact that God is holy. And interestingly enough, this is a communicable attribute of God. He is perfectly holy, and he calls us to be holy. In fact, he has even made a way for us to share in his perfect holiness. And this is the essence of the whole gospel. The fact that we are saved, the Bible says, to the uttermost, that we are completely saved. The only way for a sinful being to be completely saved is for that sin to be washed away. And the way that he does that is that he gives us his holiness. He imputes to us his righteousness. He presses it upon us in Christ. Well, let's kind of think about what does it mean when we say that God is holy. In fact, this is one of the first um, attributes that I think of. When I think of God, I immediately think of the word holy. And and part of the reason for that is, is that the word holy means not like the rest. It means set apart. Um, and that, in its essence, is who God truly is. And he's not like the rest because he is the creator and everything else is the created. So the creator is in his creation, but he is separate from it in that he is beyond his creation. He's beyond it in time. He's beyond it in space. He's beyond it in every way. And so God's holiness means that he is truly set apart. It doesn't only mean that that he is pure, but it does mean that he is pure. One of the things that I I think about is in Psalm 24 and verse 3, we read about the fact that God dwells in a holy place. Look what it says in Psalm 24, 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy? holy place. So he has a special place, a holy place. This was communicated to us through the Sabbath as well, the Lord's day, the day that is set aside to, for God to be worshiped is called the Lord's day. It is holy under the Sabbath. Listen to Exodus chapter 20. It says, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So it was a day that was set apart from the rest of the days, and it was set apart for his worship. When we think about the Sabbath day was made holy, we think about it because it set aside the ordinary activities of our lives. Now, this is one of the ways in which we can see one of the attributes of God in our everyday lives. God has given us a life to live, a job to have, family to care for, responsibilities to have. But he has also told believers all through time that they need to set aside a day for him and make it holy for him, to make it worship 
to make the day set aside for worship of him. So when we think about God's holiness, we can apply that to our lives in the fact that we've been given, given seven days out of the week and that we are to set aside one of those days and call it the Lord's day. Now, every day is the Lord's day. Every day is to be lived for him. But in a special way, we're called to set it aside. As we do that, as we set aside a day for rest and a day for worship, what happens is we start to see who God is more and more. And so our other six days have, are, are much richer and have uh, far greater um, beauty in them because we have set aside a day, as God has called us to, to learn of who he is, to see of who he is, to worship him and to enjoy him, and it brings a wellness to the other days that he has given us. God himself is what is called, the Bible calls, the most holy one. He is the most holy one of Israel. Psalm 71, Psalm 89, Isaiah 1, 4. There's several different passages that talk about the fact that God is the most holy one. Um, we also read in Isaiah that one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the Old Testament is where it describes Isaiah's vision um, coming in before the Lord, and he says that he sees two seraphim angels above the Lord. And those two seraphim angels cry out day and night. They cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so this is part of Isaiah's vision of the presence of God, the glory of God. The Lord is on his throne. And these fiery angels, seraph means fire. So these angels of fire, which also is a representation of purity, a purifying effect um, in that, the, the, the purifying effect of fire, bringing about and declaring the holiness of who God is. The psalmist says in, 90, in Psalm 99 and Psalm 5 and Psalm 22, the Lord our God is holy. Now, this is an important concept for us to think about because we see all around us the things in the world that are unholy. And we see the effect of that. We see the pain and the struggle and the sickness and uh, even the death that comes about as a result of the the. Uh, creation being uh, cut off and broken from broken in its being cut off from God. God calls us to be a people that recognizes that he restores us to his holiness. And so part of his redemption process in that is setting aside a nation for himself through which he would bless the world. And he called that nation a holy nation. That nation was set aside. It was set apart for a purpose, to be his. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2 says it, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Exodus 19, he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. And then he says, a holy nation. So this kingdom of priests or a nation set aside from the other nations on the earth through which Messiah would come to save us. And so a kingdom of priests to our God. That's in the Old Testament. Jesus comes and Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. He rises again, overcoming our sin and shame and death. And then all who call upon Christ, all who come to faith in Christ are in his new covenant. And the new covenant says this about his people. It says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But in Christ, we can be made holy. In Christ, we share his holiness. That's in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, 14, without holiness, no one is going to see God. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10, look what it says. It says, we share his holiness. Now that is amazing. And that is amazing for everyday life. That our position in Jesus Christ, if you are in the new covenant of being in Jesus Christ, that God makes us holy. He gives to us his holiness. He imputes it to us. Paul encourages Christians to be separate from the world around them. We see this throughout Paul's letters. We see that the, the world of unbelievers around us 
often dominates our thinking. And this is why Christians need to be aware of how much influence their non-believing friends are having upon their lives and upon their hearts. I just want to say to you that as Christians, we should have non-Christians who are friends. We should go after them in love. We should love them for who they are. And we should pray for them and hope for them that they would come to knowledge of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We should not live in a bubble where we do not have non-Christian friends. But there are many Christians that do not have a sufficient base of friends who share in the holiness of God, who share in the new covenant with Christ. And many Christians struggle greatly because they are so surrounded with unbelieving people that the unholiness of the world keeps rubbing off on them and into their lives through their friends who do not know him. Um, I want to encourage you that you need to have your closest friends and your most numerous friends need to be followers of Jesus Christ. Um, I believe that that is a very, very important thing, especially as cultural Christianity dies around us and uh, secularism and a great worldliness, and really a great ungodliness, a great unholiness rises up around us. We need to have strong friends that are believers in Christ. When Christians suffer in this life, they need to be very careful who they are talking to about their suffering. When Christians are struggling, maybe in a relationship, maybe it's to your husband or to your wife, um, that maybe there's some marital conflict, there's some struggle there. You need to be careful that who you're talking to, that they are giving you the advice that comes from God, that they are giving you advice that would come from Scripture. And so that your friends that are around you helping you deal with the struggle of your life are giving you holy advice, advice that doesn't come from the world, but comes from a holy and wise God, because his ways are very different than the ways of the world. And so in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, Paul encourages us this. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, and listen to this, make holiness perfect in the fear of God. So we are to embrace a holiness that causes us to know God, respect God, be in awe of God, to properly fear him. Um, when we have a very secular view of God, a low view of God, we don't tend to have a holy fear of him. And uh, the Bible says that only those who fear the Lord will see him and be with him. It's rather uh, counterintuitive to us. We, we would think those who aren't afraid of God um, would be very close to God, but the opposite of that is true. The more you come to know who he is and his holiness and his righteousness, we come to see that we, have, we are, should have an extremely high respect and regard for who he is. You see, the church itself is intended... Um, by God to grow into a holy temple of the Lord. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 21. Our church should be a holy temple that God lives in, not like the world, not running in the values of the world. Christ's present work for the church is that he might sanctify us. He's making us more holy. He's cleansing us. Um, and that he might present the church to himself in splendor that she might be holy and without blemish. Um, that is what Christ is doing. Now, the amazing thing is, in our church, we've studied the grand narrative of the Bible. If you want to do boil the Bible down to four words, you can boil the whole plan of God down to creation. He created us. The fall, we fall into sin. We rebel against God. Redemption, this is the idea that he is he is coming and he's saving us out of our sin and then he's going to restore it. Or we've used the word glory, um, but that's part of the idea of restoring it. We, we are on our way to a restored creation. 
And that's exactly what God is going to do. Now, in Zechariah, we see a picture of this restored creation. And it shows us that all of the earth is going to be restored and everything that God has designed is going to be used again for his service and for his service alone, not for any other services that are, that are not honoring to God. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 21 says this, On that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and on the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as bowls before the altar, and every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be sacred to the Lord of hosts, shall be holy to the Lord of hosts. This means that every useful thing, everything, whether it be a person or whether it be an object, all of creation is going to be for the service of God and in the use of God. So, When we think about our lives and we think about who God is as being holy and just and righteous in all of his ways, that he calls us to be like him. He communicates to us this righteousness, this holiness through Jesus Christ. And he does that by forgiving us of our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. He shares with us his holiness. Now, if he's willing to do that, The Bible says, as Christians, we must be in pursuit of his holiness, that we are to pursue the position that he's given us in him so that we may be like him. Tremendous blessings come from pursuing God and his holiness. When we say no to the things of the world and yes to the things that are right and true, his blessings come upon our life. It doesn't mean all of our problems go away in a fallen world. There's still going to be problems. But we're on route, we are in route to a place and a time where it says that every tear shall be wiped away. Every disease will be finished. And there will be no more death and no more sorrow any longer. This is where the holiness of, God's lead, the holiness of God leads us. And so, friends, as you're seeking to live honoring to the Lord, as you're seeking to make decisions in your speech, in the way that you talk, in your mind, in the ways that you think, we looked at that Sunday from Philippians 4, that our, we are to think the thoughts of God, think about the things of God. What we do with our hands, what we do with our lives, what we do with our bodies, what we do with our money, what we do with our time, that these have all been made for God. And that they have all been made to be in service of the Lord. And we do that in faith. We do that with joy. And listen, we do that where there is great reward. In Hebrews eleven six, it says that the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. And that he is coming to us. He is coming and his reward is in, is in his hand. So may we pursue him with all of our might, soul, and strength and be holy unto him. Let's pray together. We want to remember to pray for a few different things in the life of our church. We're praying for Billy Johns, who is struggling with cancer. His cancer struggle continues in a great way. Uh, We want to be lifting Billy up to the Lord. There are others in the life of the church, too, that are struggling not only with cancer, but with other um, sicknesses and illnesses. We want to pray for those who are caring for people who are sick. We have many medical community um, servants in the life of our church, um, doctors and nurses and medical staff in facilities. We want to continue to lift them up. The situation with COVID is very serious. Um, obviously, we're not meeting together. Um, I want to encourage you to be praying for um, those um, not only in our church, but all of those that are seeking to care for those that are suffering um, with COVID. We pray for that. We need to be praying for our leaders as well um, in our community in our state, um, for our nation. We want to be lifting them to the Lord and asking that God would give them wisdom and uh, that despite all the politics, that they would make right decisions that are good for us and good for the people around us. And I want to also encourage you to continue to pray for your church family. Pray for the church that shares um, your place of worship. Um, Pray that we would be drawn close together even though Uh, We're separated in distance a lot in these days. Pray that God would be caring for one another um, through us and we would be seeing those opportunities. So let's bow to the Lord of prayer before we go.
Father, thank you for this opportunity uh, for us to remember who you are, to remember your holiness. I pray that we would see that you have called us to be like you in our everyday life and that in our week that we would set aside a day to worship you and that we would be careful to pursue you and the things of you. Father, I pray that our thoughts would be your thoughts and, Father, that our desires would be your desires. Lord, help us to grow in our holiness. Lord, we also want to lift up to you some of the folks that we just love and care for that are suffering. We do lift up to you Billy Johns and Jesse. Father, we pray that your healing hand would be upon Billy. We pray that you would sustain him. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, the various treatments that are seeking to bring his cancer under control so that it can be operable, um, Lord, we ask for that. We, we pray that you would open that door. And Father, I know that there's many others that are dealing with various um, concerns of health and even the issue of COVID or the threat of COVID is heavy on their heart. Lord, I pray that we would look to you and trust in you in these times of uncertainty. Lord, that we would be people of the light, that we would shine the light of Christ brightly, that our hope would be in you, that we would say we know that God is coming and he's going to make all things new. And Lord, the promises that you have made in your word would be that which inspires our hearts through these hard times. Father, we especially lift up to you the doctors and the nurses and the hospital staff, and the attending caregivers that we have in our church family and those that are in our community. Father, we pray that you would give them strength. We pray that you would protect them from illness. And Father, we pray that you would encourage their hearts. Father, I pray that in the midst of the discouragement of so much struggle and pressure, Lord, that you would encourage their hearts and cause them to have strength that is new. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving our church. Thank you for laying down your life that we might be um, your children, that we might be brothers and sisters in the same house. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that you would draw us together that much more until the day of Christ when we finally see you face to face. In the glorious name of Christ, we pray for these we love, in the church we love, And Lord, that we would honor you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. We look forward to seeing you Sunday night. I want to encourage you, if uh, you haven't um, already looked at the message from last week, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, Allow God's word to speak to your heart. Also, I want to encourage you to be reaching out to the people in your community group. Um, I want to encourage you to be just caring for those that are in your neighborhood that go to the life of this church. Encourage them, uh, call on them, check on them, and uh, make sure that they are, they are well and if they need anything that you would maybe help meet that need. Some of you have asked about giving. Yes, you can give online. You can give by envelope. You can even give by stopping by here at the church and dropping it in the mailbox. You don't have to be in touch with anyone. Our mailbox is a secure mailbox, and uh, many folks have have found different ways to give along those lines. But we praise God for your faithfulness in that. We look forward to another day. We look forward to a time when we will be together. Until then, we're going to do the best we can with what we have. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, and we look forward to seeing you Sunday.